started a little bit late, but uh, we're all here now, and um, I'm looking forward to today. Today is the second last day of Final Week 2013, uh, but we're not done yet. So I'm happy to see uh, all of you here. Um, how many of you saw the Kristen Kimball event Thursday night presentation of the book? Good, good. Um, the, the book was A Dirty Life, and it was all about, it was a subtitle, uh, a memoir of food farming and love, and it was a great presentation. Uh, Kristen had a lot of, of great information uh, that she didn't even have time to get to, uh, but we, uh, those of us who were there and listened to her and saw the pictures, I think we all wished that uh, we lived at the Essex farm, the farm that she runs is, uh, was a little bit closer to Boston. But she did ask the audience, how many of you are farmers um, or are doing farming or gardening to some degree? And a lot of hands went up in the audience. Uh, so uh, we're going to get into what's happening here in, in Brookline, in Boston, and towards the second part of the program. But uh, one of the questions that the audience asked was uh, what can we do here in the city? Um, and this is exactly what this event is all about and why it is part of Climate Week and why it was scheduled uh, to follow uh, Kristen Kimball's presentation. Uh, the reality is that, that we don't live next to Essex Farm and we don't have 500 acres of continuous open uh, fields to farm. Um, but uh, Kristen's first answer to the question of what do we do in the city was support those people in the audience who did raise their hand and said that they were farmers or uh, involved in the farming business or gardening or whatever, is to support those folks and support the, the movement. Uh, so there is some farming in the metropolitan area. There is even a farm in Brooklyn. Um, there are things happening here, and there are things that we can do as individuals. Uh, a subject as basic as food you know, has a huge uh, scope, and there's only so much depth that we can get into today. Uh, but the whole goal of Climate Week is to inform, to inspire, and to facilitate. So uh, we hope that we can do that today. We hope that you'll walk away uh, have you learned something that you did not know before? Uh, that you're inspired to do something yourself this year, get a little closer to the process that produces the food that you eat, uh, that you eat healthier, and that uh, you have some info and links today uh, that can get you started in that direction. So along those lines, um, I began to plan this event the last fall. I happened to come across a report by the Conservation Law Foundation, CLA. It's called Growing Green, Measuring Benefits, Overcoming Barriers, and Nurturing Opportunities for Urban Agriculture <coughs> in Boston. So I contacted CLA, asked if someone could come and talk to us about these findings. Uh, I think the report offers a perspective about trying to accomplish the same goals as the Essex Farm is doing in upstate New York, but doing it in a way that can be done in an urban setting. Uh, the report also is unique in that it talks about policy and legal barriers uh, to urban farming, and also talks about business models, scaling up uh, an endeavor like that so that it has a, a, a significant impact on a large community in an urban area. Uh, Jennifer Rushlow uh, from CLF, has uh, agreed to kick off today talking about her area of expertise, which is legal and policy matters. Uh, following her, we will uh, hear from Glenn Lloyd, who can talk about more about economics and the uh, hybrid business model and some of the things he's doing, both profit and nonprofit ventures. And then we're gonna bring it closer to home uh, with a, at a more personal level, uh, where we have people on the panel representing important local organizations who are doing things leading the way and can help each of us uh, get involved. Uh, 
Um, so before I formally introduce Jennifer here, a uh, few housekeeping notes. Bathrooms are over here on my left. Um, we're going to go for one hour with the formal program. So at about uh, 2.15, we will take a pause. And at that point, you know, if anybody needs to leave and so forth, they, they, they can do so uh, politely. I hope that uh, we'll have some more questions and discussions and can keep it going a little bit longer because an hour is, is uh, not much time really to cover the topic this big. Uh, we've got info, information at the tables in the back. Uh, this is a small room. We don't have a mic set up, but I don't think we really need the mic. If, if you're not hearing us, just uh, raise a hand sure that you do. Um, okay. Now, uh, Jennifer Russell, she is a staff attorney at CLO, Massachusetts, working on clean air, energy, and environmental justice issues. Uh, before joining CLF, uh, Jenny was an associate at Anderson and Krieger, LLP in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, she was appointed co-chair of the Boston Bar Association Environmental Law Sections Pro Bono and Public Service Committee. She's a member of the Environmental Section Steering Committee. Uh, she holds a JD from Northeastern University, uh, a Master's in Public Health from Tufts, and a BA in Environmental Studies and Visual Art from Oberlin College. So, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Jennifer. So to dive right in, why is this important? 
Urban agriculture can provide a lot of things to our communities. It can provide economic, environmental, and human health benefits. And as you'll see on the infographic on the next slide, CLF analyzed the potential for these benefits in Boston specifically. And we did that by looking at what we could generate in terms of benefits if we were to use a 50-acre parcel in the middle of Boston for, ur for urban agriculture. So this is the infographic, and this, was, this is part of the Growing Green Report. The results of our research showed that if you put 50 acres of land, which is the size of Boston Common, into agriculture in Boston, you could create several measurable improvements. You could reduce methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas, by almost 5,000 tons. You could reduce other greenhouse gas emissions by 110 tons. You could create 223 jobs, just from Boston Common alone. You could produce over a million pounds of produce in one year, and you could generate more than six million servings of food annually. The numbers are pretty staggering. That's not that big a piece of land. If urban farming on a plot the size of Boston Common could make this much of a difference, imagine how much we could accomplish by increasing urban agriculture throughout the greater Boston area. Next slide. So we've established that it benefits us to expand urban agriculture in Boston. But how do we get there? There's a growing interest but we need to leverage that interest into actual results. We need to identify and eliminate existing policy barriers that are currently making it difficult for farmers and food entrepreneurs to get off the ground in the Boston area. And Growing Green addressed that need. So our research was organized along a food system supply chain framework, and we focused on key policies and market barriers at various stages of the process, moving all the way from pre-production all the way through to waste. Now to really deep dive, I'm gonna talk about access to land specifically, which is on the front end of the food system. Access to land for farming is one of the most significant challenges to expanding farming in, in urban settings and really expanding farming anywhere. Uh, but the challenge is exacerbated in <coughs> Boston. Most of the land is developed, the land that is undeveloped is very expensive, which can be difficult for a small, low margin operation to even get a piece of land with which to get started. So in improving zoning and land tenure options are two of the biggest opportunities in law and policy to reduce land access burdens. To talk about zoning, in Boston, there have been uh, multiple waves of rezoning efforts in the last few years that will help clarify where and what type of farming can occur within the city limits. It started with the creation of an urban agriculture overlay district in South Dorchester, which made a couple of plots available, and actually um, Glenn's organization has been part of that. Um, for, a, for a low cost lease to use small plots that are owned by the city. And they opened that up to qualified applicants, which meant for profit fruit and um, vegetable producers. So, this area, while it had an underlying zoning of residential use, um, by creating an overlay district, it allowed uh, people who took over those plots to also use it for urban farming instead of residential if they'd like. There were a number of legal issues that were involved in making these parcels available for that purpose. Um, most notably, there were um, concerns around safety issues and liability related to contaminated soil, which is a very common issue in urban settings. Um, and this actually created a, a great deal of controversy in members of the community that felt that there were safety concerns with farming on this soil and that they hadn't been adequately consulted about the decision to put it into urban farming. They felt it put them at risk if they were to eat that food. Um, they were able to work through that process and have now come to the other side. And now the city has expanded its rezoning efforts into more of a citywide rezoning initiative uh, where they'll amend the Boston Zoning Code to address all kinds of urban farming issues, not just growing produce, but keeping hens for eggs, keeping other types of livestock, aquaculture, hydroponics, growing on roofs, really pretty much everything I've been able to think of has been showing up in this revised zoning code. So they've been drafting that. It's been a very long process that's involved a lot of public input based on the negative experience they had in Dorchester where they didn't really engage the public sufficiently. And they'll be releasing those draft, that draft's new code um, soon and going out to different neighborhoods to get feedback. To talk about land tenure, this is also a way we can help urban agriculture thrive. Um, farmers can either own or lease the land they use for farming, and they can do that either individually or as a group with others to reduce costs. Private ownership of urban land is something we don't see a lot around here. It's more common in cities where there are struggling economies and low development pressure where land is relatively inexpensive, like uh, Detroit, 
you see this in the news sometimes that they're, they're booming urban agriculture and you try all the cheap to get land. In Boston, leasing arrangements are much more common uh, as opposed to private ownership. And leased land can be made available to farmers through a number of different arrangements. Um, but one recurring issue we've been seeing coming up is that the lease terms that are offered are very short. So for instance, in the urban agriculture zoning district, the city parcels that were made available were for a lease of about five years, I think. Um, and for many, uh, many farmers and, and food entrepreneurs, that lease is gonna be awfully short. Um, farmers put a lot of resources into developing the quality of soil on their properties, and particularly on an urban setting where you're likely to be using raised beds and bringing in all new soil, that's a big investment to only have five years to recover what you put in and make a profit. Um, so there are pros and cons to different leasing arrangements, but the duration of the term is definitely something that should be considered in the development of policy uh, to address land access issues. CLF has also been addressing the ongoing land access issue by trying to get information out and available to people about what publicly owned plots of land could potentially be converted into urban farming. And so we created a GIS map of municipal and state-owned land that's vacant and suitable for agriculture in terms of its current use and the type of soil that's present. And so the next slide shows you that map, and I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see, but um, the green, are the parcels that could be used for agriculture. And it's interesting to see where in the state they're located. There's actually a lot in central maps. Next slide, please. So moving on to soil safety, soil quality. Um, as you can imagine, the quality of the soil directly relates to the quality of the food that's produced. Contamination of land in cities like Boston is very common, as I mentioned just as a result of, even if it's not some major oil spill or something like that, as a result of everyday activity over the decades, deposits of lead and things like that from um, emissions from cars and coal plants, it accumulates over the years and, and leads to soil being contaminated. Um, if we're going to expand agriculture in Boston, we're gonna have to figure out how to deal with the soil contamination issue, and not just in terms of the safety of the soil, but also in terms of liability because fear of liability for having to clean up soil can really be something that prevents you from taking on a new piece of land. So um, the law that's applicable in Massachusetts is called the Oil <coughs> Hazardous Material Release Prevention and Response Act, which is long, it's chapter 21E of the Mass General Law, so I'll call it 21E. Um, it makes owners and operators liable for releases of hazardous material on property. The key there is an operator it could be someone who's leasing, you don't have to own something to be liable. Um, it's a law that's meant to protect us, and in many cases it does. And I can tell you as an environmental lawyer, there are a lot of things this law does that prevent us from getting into really nasty situations. But in the agriculture setting, it really creates some problems. It can create a perverse incentive for people to not test their soil because they're afraid of what they'll find out and the liability that will come with it. So this could mean that either they don't test the soil and they farm anyway, produce food that takes up that contamination, feed it to people, it's very unsafe, or it could mean that they just are unwilling to take on new pieces of land for fear of what they'll find out if they test. Both results are not ideal. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lack of guidance on this issue from the state. Um, and so CLF has advocated for the Mass Department of Environmental Protection to create best management practices where if a farmer followed what the state determined to be a safe protocol, they would not risk liability for use of that property. That hasn't happened yet. Um, but one thing the state has started doing is they're creating some regulations that would, um, when you engage in cleanup of a contaminated site, it would result in um, a clause in the deed showing uh, that it has been cleaned up to a point that it was safe to use for agriculture down the road, so that you at least see if you, if you looked at the history of the property, whether or not it was safe for agriculture. So they're working on that now, step in the right direction. Next slide. <coughs> Turning to the flip side of the healthy soil <coughs> issue is compost production, which is also a key issue that needs to be addressed for urban agriculture. Um, if we're gonna expand urban agriculture in Boston, there's going to be an increased demand for compost, and there are a lot of benefits to the creation of compost. Um, if organic matter sits in landfills, it generates a lot of methane, which is a greenhouse gas that can lead to climate change. If we turn that organic waste into compost, it's a win-win. We reduce the climate change concerns by sitting in a landfill, it improves the health of the soil, and actually healthy soil can sequester carbon 
take carbon out of the atmosphere and help reduce climate change impacts. So not only is it leading to healthier food, um, but it, it has a number of climate change impacts as well. Also, the composting process can be a source of energy through the use of anaerobic digesters from off-gassing of the, comp the com natural composting process. Um, so these are all good things, but in order to achieve this, we actually have needed some policy reform to help facilitate um, commercial compost operators from being able to do what they need to do. So the DEP actually adopted some new rules toward this Mass Department of Environmental Protection, sorry, DEP, um, to help make this possible, <coughs> and they reduced the regulatory burden on composting facilities, which will help kind of create an influx of these new facilities that can create more compost, so that's great. Um, to give you a sense of how this is kind of a nuanced process where more is good, but it has to be done carefully, CLF really thinks that the rules could still be improved. Um, there's a need to improve the screening tool to make sure that the inputs that become compost are safe, um, so that we're not just recontaminating soil that we're trying to decontaminate, and there need to be monitoring and reporting requirements to really make sure that every stage of this process is being done safely. So moving in the right direction, but it's hard to get, um, to get it done perfectly. So now that I've talked about uh, some land access and soil quality issues, which are really kind of on the front end of the food system, I want to give you a sense of some of the issues that play out later on in the process, namely in the food processing, aggregation, and distribution part of the food system. So, um, there's a lot to talk about here, but I thought I'd highlight two examples that can illustrate some of the regulatory barriers and solutions that are going on. So I'm going to talk about poultry and raw milk. On the poultry side, consolidation and vertical integration within the industry have been rampant, which have led to massive animal processing operations, CAFOs, not good for the environment, not good for food safety. This is where you hear about uh, contamination issues with chicken that you hear about in the news. Um, on the other side of that, there's great consumer interest in poultry from <coughs> small local operators. However, what we're hearing is that those operators have experienced a lack of access to processing facilities. And that would actually prevent some potential new chicken farmers from entering the business because they wouldn't have a way to process the chicken that they make, that they, that they grow. On the um, so a solution that was created to try and address this problem in 2008 was the Mobile Poultry Processing Unit which is a mobile trailer that's fitted with processing equipment that's driven around the state to various farms. So it goes to the farmer, rather than the farmer having to go to a processing unit. And it was a joint project set up as a pilot by a few state agencies and the New England Small Farm Institute and the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project, a great project run out of tubs. To be an eligible producer to use this farm, you have to raise fewer than 20,000 chickens or less than 5,000 turkeys. So that kind of gives you a sense of how big it can get if that's considered small. Um, and you have, to be, you have to be engaging in direct sales to consumers to be considered the small enough type of, type of uh, operation that they're looking to help. So this was piloted for four years. And this was a really useful process because rather than the state developing regulations based on what they thought this might look like or what they thought would be useful, they watched this process play out. And after that, they developed regulations that suited it. And so it, it really, they came at it from both sides and arrived at a solution that was well tailored to the size of the operation. And I think that's a model that we could duplicate in other areas. On the raw milk buying club side, uh, many food advocates believe that pasteurization kills good bacteria in milk, diminishes vitamin content, and denatures proteins that are valuable to our body. Um, and on the economic side, raw milk uh, operations actually increase the viability of local dairies because the production costs are low and ultimately what you can charge for a gallon of raw milk is much higher than what you can charge for pasteurized milk. You can get up to 10 to 12 dollars a gallon for raw milk, I'm told. Um, but there's some regulatory barriers actually to getting raw milk to consumers. In Massachusetts, farmers can only sell raw milk directly from the farm and you have to be licensed to do so. So if you or I wanted to purchase raw milk, we'd have to drive to wherever the farm is which can result in a lot of transportation costs and, and make it not feasible for people to do it. And so people got together and created buying clubs where one person would go out and get the milk for a bunch of people and bring it back. The Mass Department of Agricultural Resources did not care for this approach. Um, they felt that it was risky and that if people weren't actually going to the farm, they wouldn't hear about the real risks associated with 
raw milk, because as I'm sure you've heard, people have differing views about how dangerous it is. Um, I can understand they're, they're wanting to make sure people are well informed. I think there are other ways to make sure they get that information. We accomplish that with labeling in just about every other setting. Um, but they tried to pass a rule that would have banned buying clubs. And uh, we were talking about this earlier. There was so much outrage at this rule that they couldn't actually fit all the people who showed up to the public hearing in the room. Uh, they left about half of them out, which created all kinds of open meeting law issues and turned into a big disaster, a big press disaster for the Ag Department. And so they pulled the rule. They decided not to do it. Um, and so the problem's gone away for now, but it just highlights the fact that you know agencies can have very reasonable concerns wanting to protect the safety of people, but they can come up with solutions that are very unreasonable and prevent people who demand a, you know, a viable product from being able to get it. And so making sure that, that the um, solution fits the problem is really a challenge that we have in, in helping local ag succeed. Last slide. So I've given you a few examples. That's by no means all of them, um, but I hope that gives you a flavor for how public policy can really affect our ability to foster a local sustainable food system. Um, if you'd like to read a copy of our Growing Green Report, we have a couple copies in the back. Um, it's also available online, and the link is here. I hope you'll take a look. Um, and if this interests you, if you believe that we should be working to support a sustainable food system in New England, I hope you'll consider becoming a member of CLF. Um, we do depend on the support of members and foundations to do our work, and there's a lot of work left to do. So you can sign up with Devin if you'd like to, or online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Those are the aspects of uh, what we're ultimately trying to accomplish that sort of lie below the surface until we run into them. And uh, it's, uh, one, that's what I like about the, the CLF report because it really exposes these issues that we have to deal with. If Tristan was talking about how they got around some of these things, again, they have the benefit of being in rural country. It's a little bit more difficult here. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, we're going to move on now to Glenn Lloyd, who is, is a name that if you read the CLF report, you'll see that he's prominently mentioned in that report. And uh, let me just give you some of uh, Glenn's background. He's a graduate of Boston University. Uh, he taught uh, fifth and sixth grades in Louisiana public school system uh, for some time uh, after BU. I taught some GED to young and older students in Boston. He's been an activist in Boston and in a number of different ventures. Founder and CEO of City Fresh Foods for Boston uh, for 15 years now. Uh, City Fresh won Small Business Administration Award for Young Entrepreneur of the Year and uh, Boston's Black and White Business Profile Award. And Glenn had an early start in entrepreneurship. Uh, he started a landscape business at the age of 12. Uh, and he was doing $100,000 a year in business by the time he graduated from high school. <laughs> so here's a, here's a man who definitely has the, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, we'd like to, him to give us a little insight of, of that part of, of urban agriculture. And um, he's, he's at the forefront of, of it all. And I think he has some very interesting uh, insight to us. How y'all doing today? Good. So I'll start by uh, just kind of segueing from, I guess this, you guys are talking about climate, climate issues, uh, into uh, more specifically around urban farming. And um, you know, I think that I've been hearing these reports that we're producing roughly about 12 to 15% of our food locally. And uh, folks are saying that we should be able to get to over 50%. And I'm hearing that the year 2060, 20, we literally should have the ability to produce more than half of our food locally. So I actually want to talk a little bit about how we get there from an from a entrepreneurial and from a local operator point of view. Um, and clearly, I think most folks in this room know why that's important from a climate and environmental, right? Just basically around carbon footprint, uh, our reliance on cheap oil. I mean, I've been in the food business now going on three or four decades. And what I tell people a lot is how fragile the system is. We don't even realize it. Um, and I, don't, I'll, I won't get too much into that because I think this group probably knows a, lot, knows a lot of those details. But clearly, we need a different way of how we grow food, how we distribute food, and how we're uh, you know we're eating food. And, uh, and, and you see 
uh, lights at the end of the tunnel, and you see these, you know, the growth of farmers markets, the growth of CSA, the, the, this new energy around local food. So it's all exciting, but at the same time, you have this conventional system that's highly influential and really tough to crack. Um, so I actually, uh, I just want to quickly say that, um, you know, I actually am of, of the philosophy that demand in the market drives a lot of this, and that's us. It's everyone in this room. You know, how, how we, what our habits are. Um, I also know that on the other side, you know, the, the ability to produce is also very important. So that's a small number of us. You know, we have we have producers here, and and then there's a lot in between, which is which is the packaging side, the distribution side. So um, it, to me, it's a really exciting time to be having this conversation. So a um, little bit about me. Actually, my main job is running a food service company. So I had a couple slides and bring you into a commercial kitchen, but we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just quickly, but we can run, run through these slides. Um, we basically run a, a food service company. Uh, we're doing 12,000 meals a day. We're feeding everywhere from the child care to the school age, all the way to the elder. And I bring this up because I know uh, my team, and so we know how to operate. We know how to operate uh, a manufacturing company, essentially. And same, so, so a lot of the same issues when you talk about farming and so on and so forth. It's, it's, about, it's about labor, about your product, about, it's about moving, you know, moving your product through a system. Um, let me go ahead to the next slide. It's all about the employees, happy employees, right? Make for a better, better product. Uh, and uh, next slide. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, that's, that's, our, that's our line. So we, we're producing on the, on the line, the, um, the hot line, and then it moves to, we, we're packaging individually, we're packaging bulk. Uh, next slide. Oh, those good looking guys right there. And you should get, you get a sense of the back of the kitchen there. Uh, next slide. And then we're all, all, all the way through to distribution. So we're, we're, um, we're moving the product through. And, and we do a lot of home delivery to the elders. We do a lot of institutional delivery to the schools and such. Uh, we, have, we have our own vehicles. And just to give you a sense of what my backdrop is, I've been doing this now for, uh, thank you, for, um, geez, since 94, 95. So that's 18 years, right, mm -hmm. building, this, building this company up. And you're not doing it without the, without the people that look, looking. But we're here to talk about urban farming. So I, I just wanted to um, start off um, by saying that uh, urban farming is a vision concept, right? So we're gonna just take a little t time to think about really what that can be. And I think in Brooklyn it's probably even more congested than most parts of the city, but um, when you look back, and when you think about vacant space and vacant land, we actually have a lot more than we, than we realize. And actually in the city, it's uh, estimated to be around 800 acres of vacant land. And, uh, and just for the record, most of that land is in communities of color. It's in, in the communities of Rockbridge, Dorchester, Mattapan. And there's a whole history around the land that, again, we don't have time to get into now. But the bottom line is it exists. It's been vacant for uh, you know, decades, and, and, and it looks like it's going to be vacant for decades to come. So some folks have come around and say, well, what do we do about this? And again, what we talked about, especially in Boston, we have the demand, right? We have people who are lined up to have fresh, local, hyper-local, Low chemical products, right? Uh, salads, what do you name it, right? People, you know, someone was just saying the other day, we have like a hundred million dollar market just on cut greens alone, right? And the restaurants, they're all lined up, they want this stuff. And um, so we have the land and we actually have the labor. So we, we have all the components. How do we make it happen? And Jennifer outlined some of the barriers and challenges and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, what the, what, where the entrepreneurs, they don't, they just keep, they don't, they don't care. They just keep moving, they try to figure it out, we move forward, and that's what we try to do with city growers. And we started with grabbing some land and, and, and really making the conversation happen. Can we go to the next slide? So in, in, unlike what's happening in Allendale, and John will probably tell you how it works on a, on a more conventional farm situation, we gotta, we gotta bring the soil in. And, and, and Jennifer mentioned some of the challenges, but essentially the philosophy or the process here, it's, it's no different from the urban gardening, right? The urban gardening has been happening for decades around the Boston area. And it's really a raised bed philosophy. You're bringing in the soil and you're growing into those raised beds. We are not talking about touching any of that soil that's been there. It's, and so we're saying, you know, 12, 12 inches, 16 inches, 18 inches, that's the soil. And then if you think about from an economic point of view, that's your, that's your one of your biggest costs. Because the other part is when we talk about land, this only works if the land's pretty much free or below market. And I talked about all that land that's available. So when you get when you start off there, now you're bringing in the soil. And again, what's exciting with this industry moving on is we're to having conversations about how we produce our own soil and compost on these urban farms. Because we all know on, on the composting and recycling side, 
more than 50% of what we throw away every day can be composted. So instead of filling up our landfills with this stuff, we can actually convert it over to farm, but we've got to do it right, right? We have to do it under, under the right um, structure, operating structure, and so on and so forth. So that's exciting in the near future. How do we produce our own soil from an economic point of view and from an environmental point of view? Uh, next slide. There was, we, got, we have some, uh, so there one. But anyway, so there, there's, there's a, some soil coming in, <coughs> forming beds. Next slide. And, and that's actually um, a site on Glenway Street in Dorchester. And we, we are, City Growers is, this past year we've grown four plots. The average plot's about a quarter acre. And um, I want to highlight this one because for a number of reasons. One is, it's right in the neighborhood, right? Can you see the houses and all that stuff? So there's a whole component around how you relate to the community, which is very important. And who, who goes into, you know, who's representing and so on and so forth, who the farmers are. So where are the philosophy? It's really, you know, it's, this is urban-based concept, so it needs to be urban-based. Who's, who's doing the work, where the resources are going, and so on, so I'm a big proponent of that, right? Uh, you know, uh, and so that's one piece. And the other piece is actually, this neighborhood in particular, you know, unfortunately, uh, gets in the paper a little bit and not for good things. So there's, there's a lot of crime around this neighborhood, and actually there's, there's, there's three young ladies who were killed in a car. Um, they were, um, I think at the end of the summer, so folks may remember that, atrocious. That's on Harvard Street, which is like a stone's throw away from this farm. And there's a lot of other bias that took place. The young folks who came to work on this land uh, this past summer, you know, I'm busy running around, and I didn't realize how much of an impact it was on their lives, because they came every day, they stayed focused, and they didn't, you know, they didn't retaliate, they didn't, they stayed. They, the, the land itself was like a healing, a healing mechanism. For them, right? And I literally cried when I heard how awful that was for these young folks. But that, to me, is what we're, all, what, what we're talking about. And what we're talking about is the young guys like AJ and Rick who are on this piece of land, they're learning the craft of growing, and for our, in our case, growing for market. And then we want them back on this land again, here's your farm. Here's your plot of land in your community, which actually is creating income for yourself. And, and that, that's the philosophy around City Grow, is you're spreading that, uh, that potential. Uh, now to get there is a, is a, is a different story because it, it, we have a whole host of challenges that we you know, got to talk about, about some of them. Um, from an operating point, point of view also. Um, a little bit about the business. Uh, we can do another slide too. Um, that's, that's, the, uh, that's, that's the team that was at the Sportsman's and another, another one of our plots. And now oh, we go back, we go back one. Let's stay with the good looking people for a second. Yeah, oh, this is our Marco Tesla, yeah, yeah. So we, um, most of our crop actually is, uh, is greens. It's in the form of cut greens or head lettuce. Actually, in arugula, those are the top three. And that was almost 80% of our crop this year. Right? We also did carrots and tomatoes. We did tomatoes. The interesting thing about tomatoes is we had that blight issue the previous year. But when you talk about urban gardening, right, you can kind of sneak away from some of these things, right? Because we were like, well, you know, is it going to hit some of these, you know, isolated plots? And so that's on, you know, plus we don't have to deal with deer. You know, there's other things that we don't have to deal with, but um, which actually is advantageous. Uh, and then you, I'm oh, sorry. Just that's the photo that's in this morning's book. That's right. That's right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the only good photo we have. <laughs> right, so um, it's actually, we, we have a great article that came out the Globe today, if you haven't seen it, uh, in the G section. Uh, the reporters did a really good job. It really, it really tells a good story. Uh, I think it's a pretty complete story. Um, so, yeah, so I just mentioned some of the crops down to carrots, beets, and so forth, and that's kind of the, the piece. The, the model that we start off is wholesale, so we're wholesaling it, and it's going to, um, actually it's going to some of your top restaurants around Boston, uh, it's going to what I call some of the uh, local retailers, like City Feed and Foodies. Um, we talk to hotels, we haven't really you know, cut, cut that into that market yet, but basically <coughs> we're harvesting, we're triple washing on the land, and we're, uh, we're shipping it. Our distribution system actually, is we use an innovative program called uh, FoodX, I don't know if you guys have heard of FoodX, and they're an interesting company because they come in and have helped on that gap around the, um, about distribution transportation for small small producers. And, um, and we actually bought our own van, so now we, we, uh, we like to stay close to our customers, so we, uh, we also deliver ourselves. And, um, and that's pretty much the kind of the flow of the operation. It's, a, it's a right now, it's like a 25, 26 week uh, season. Uh, so we, we haven't really, we, we did some season extension, which I don't think I have any pictures. We did the low tunnels, which, you know, added about, I don't know, four or five weeks, and then we had issues with, you know, the 
wind and all that stuff, but we'll get better as we go. But with the low tunnels, you can get it you know, three or four weeks on either side. And then there's other technologies we're looking at. How do you how do you really push this almost you know almost all year round? Which uh, which has you know we have the potential for this. And the interesting thing about greens, I don't got to say this in front of Alan there, but you know the greens in the off season, huge marketplace, and people are, people are hungry for them. So if you can figure a way to uh, to continue to keep, you know, keep the greens going, I'm just I'm just joking, John. Uh, you know December, uh, you know January, all that stuff. Uh, we we see that as an opportunity. Um, what we found, and, and this is this is really. Uh, Bare bone, but we can go to the next slide. And this is, this is, this is a late at night uh, playing around with uh, some Excel sheets. But just from a business point of view, um, the question's been asked, you know, is this viable? Is this a viable market? And frankly, we're still answering that question. But I think I'll tell you, this season, uh, 2012, um, what we did is we did $32,000 of, of, of top line on, on roughly about, you know, um, 19,000, 18,000 square foot space. So we, we almost reached $2 a square foot. <coughs> now what does that mean? That means when you, when you go up on a, on a quarter acre plot, that's roughly about 10,000 square feet. And if you just do straight up math and say we can reach $2 a square foot, that's $20,000 that that one plot can bring in on top revenue, right? No one's getting rich here. But again, that's on about 25 week schedule. We also figured that Roughly, it's a, about a 25-75 ratio. So 75% of that money would go into the pockets of the farmers, and 25% was covered, would cover the overhead, right? So that, you know, overhead meaning, you know, your seed, your water, um, there's some administrative cost of moving the product, right? We have to make phone calls, you have to move the product, we have someone that does the, you know, the sales and stuff and so forth. That's the general ratio. Now, the question that we're asking is, who would do that? Who would take, you know, take that time and if you take 75% of 20,000 and get participation, what's that for our mathematicians in the room? 15, about $15,000, right? Uh, and about, you know, about uh, again, 25 a week, you know? So these are, these are the questions we're answering now, right? Is it a part-time job? Well, it's not really part-time. Is it a part-time thing where it enhances someone's uh, employment? Uh, you know, we talked about maybe it's, it's, you know, the immigrant population, you know, it's challenging getting jobs, second language. We're talking about the folks who are uh, coming out of the quarries, the judicial system. Is this something where, and how do we how do we really increase those numbers? Do we do value added, season extension? Can we get those numbers up? Now, we found that uh, on a quarter acre, it takes about a person and a half to, to, to manage that, right, through, through the season. So then you do the math, okay? So then you know, so that so you can get up to pay three or four hundred dollars a week in your pocket uh, during that during that uh, during that growing season. So, but to us. These are, these are really exciting numbers because it's showing viability. And when I say viability, that's again, I mentioned earlier, the land has to be for free and we have to figure out how to subsidize the infrastructure cost of, of preparing, the, uh, bringing the soil in, bringing the water in and so on and so forth. But once you take care of those things, can you put people on these, you know, these parcels of land where they're actually self-sustaining? Now, on the city growers model, we, we envision ourselves as, the, as that kind of co-op brand Right? So we have all these parcels growing food under one brand, and we basically take care of the big headaches for the farmers. And that, what is that headache? It's, it's dealing with the numbers, it's dealing with the sales, and so forth, dealing with the distribution systems, right? And let the growers grow. So when I talk about that 75, 25, <coughs> that 25% goes back to the co-op model to support the, you know, the brand and the infrastructure. You know, about, I call it the back of the house you know, systems, and the growers grow. And uh, you, know, you know, I think um, Jennifer mentioned the um, uh, 50 acres, you know, and Boston <coughs> and, and what that can do. I mean, shoot, 50 acres is about a little less than 5% of the land I mentioned earlier, right? About 800 acres, right? 2%, 3%. And this stuff, this, this stuff starts getting very interesting. We're at, we're not even in, in the ballgame right now. So this is really early, premature early. And I would say that um, what we've been doing, we go to the next slide. This only works with, with partnerships and people stepping up. And a lot of volunteer time and energy. I call it a lot of bootstrapping. You know, you know, some of my personal money is in this thing. You know, how do we keep, how do we keep this thing going uh, before it, 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 it reaches viability? And that's and that's where we're at right now. It's really it's vision, it's passion, but you know, we we you know we rob Peter to pay Paul just to, to make all this thing happen. And we uh, so so just quickly so uh, you know we we partnered with CLF Ventures early on. The Boston Foundation gave us some money to, to, to 
you know, they helped with like, almost like the research arm, really with the viability of this industry. We were, we were the practitioners in the field doing it. Um, I mentioned FoodX, who uh, they, you know, they cut, take a cut of the money to, to transport the stuff, critical though, they have it. You know, we're going out to uh, Newton, dropping food. They're already going out there. So our, our product goes on that truck, right? So it, there's a synergy that makes sense. Uh, clearly, we don't do this without the city of Boston. They own a bunch of the land, but it's their policy and their, you know, their, their advocacy. The mayor has been a really big supporter of um, everything to do with local food, you know, critical. Um, Sportsman's Tennis Club, you saw that picture, that's where it was. So community partners are important. They're the ones that, that hold, they'll hold the land to. Can't do this without the market. You know, we, we, again, we, we supply some of the top restaurants uh, in the Boston area. Um, and, 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 and again, City Feed is one of our uh, buyers too. This is interesting, because Stillman's Farm, we buy our plugs from Stillman's, right? So it, it, they're, they're a farm just outside the city. Wholesome Wave is an example of creative financing. Uh, they're one of these kind of new emerging food funds. Uh, they gave us some, technically some debt money. We'll see if we pay them back. Good enough, I'm just fine. Uh, but they, uh, they are, they're, you know, they're a huge supporter. Uh, and, and they're just one of, of, of a few folks who've really stepped up. And this is, this is a new entity that we uh, actually, um, you know, uh, helped create because we realized that in the long run, or at least in the short to intermediate run, we, we need to, bring in other types of capital sources, like from the foundations and such, right? To really do a lot of this work. So this is the Urban Farming Institute, you know. So so we say, hey, you know what? If you have a foundation, you give to the foundation. If you, if you want to get equity into, into our, our, our PT code, you can get straight to city growers. But we all work together. And, and another thing about the Urban Farming Institute, they, they also will act as a land trust to hold land. So if the neighborhood says we want to keep this as a farm, this is what the Urban Farming Institute will be able to do. And also, critically, is they help us incubate the farmers. So we are, um, they're, they're, we have a first training program this year. We have 10 uh, slots. We have a whole bunch of applicants who want to get into it. Very exciting stuff. What the, app, what the trainees will do is they'll learn how to grow on these plots. And then the following year, the goal is, here's a plot for yourselves, right? As I mentioned earlier about Rick and AJ, right? So that's the whole philosophy that's happening up here. So if you think about it, we have all these, you know, plots of land throughout Boston. You know, um, for me, when bringing back the climate, you know, issues, you know, we, we have to start growing our food more locally. Clearly, let's start right in our backyards, right? Let's start hyper local, right? How do we do that? And then we'll work our way out. <coughs> you know, we, we can, you know, again, I can talk days about this stuff, but you know, the suburbs and all that stuff. How do we convert this land? I'm not. We're not talking about even 20%. You know, back in the turn of the century, right? It was what. More than 50% of the population was involved in growing food, right? Now it's less than 1%, not sustainable. So we have to figure out, maybe, what, what is it, four, five, six percent Whatever that is, we need to get there quickly, or you know, we're in trouble, as far as I'm concerned. But that, I think that's why we're on this room. So I think that's probably all I have time for, and then we can do Q&A, but thank you. Same place you did. We had a chunk of land. 
and um, needed to figure out what to do with it. How can we how can we manage this land in such a way that it can produce a high quality uh, food for people in a sustainable way that that uh, generates revenue uh, and supports the farm. This is a this is a for profit operation. Any profit that we make goes back into the operation, but we are. Well, I guess the nice part is that I'm not a very good bureaucrat, which is why I'm not certified organic, and I don't like paperwork, and I don't like asking people for things. <laughs> Never mind money. I've always had a problem with asking people for money, which is why I don't serve on a lot of boards and foundations. Um, I assure you know what that's about. We raised uh, about 30 acres of mixed vegetables in Boston and Brookline, and then we rent 30 acres of land out in Groton that we use for um, crops that we don't need to be on all the time. So anything like lettuce, tomatoes, beans, uh, peppers, we grow in Boston. Uh, out in Groton, we grow things like carrots, onions, winter squash, pumpkins, potatoes that we, that we only need to pick maybe once a week, maybe every other week. So we try to, to keep the, the uh, high value crops close to the farm and the low maintenance crops uh, out in, in Groton, because as you can imagine, with well, the truck we use to go to Groton gets about six and a half miles per gallon. So we try not to go to Groton very often. So it's, um, we are run a uh, small CSA, it's about 350, 400 people for fresh vegetables. We run a 100 person egg CSA, we raise about 350 hens for eggs. Um, occasionally people don't believe it. You can't sell, why can't you sell me a chicken? You've got so many. Well, if I sell you a chicken, I don't get any eggs. <laughs> uh, and we grow and sell uh, flowers. We run a winter egg CSA. We're pretty self-sufficient. One of the, the things that we've been really fortunate about is that it's it's been a pretty lonely existence being a farmer in, in an urban setting because not everybody understands the, the sort of the day-to-day -day requirements of being a farmer, not the least of which is to be able to fix things and buy parts. So uh, having uh, the change in the last five to 10 years, an interest in urban agriculture and locally grown has brought a much broader interest in understanding of what it takes to be a farmer, and um, I do sit on I do sit on a, a board, a funding board, and we uh, look at agricultural projects in Massachusetts. And over the last ten years, if we look at the grants that we've made, probably seventy five percent of them have gone into projects like the Urban Farming Institute. Uh, City, um, I, mean, I want to say city growers, but I don't mean city growers corporation. I mean, people are interested in growing in the city. Immigrant farmers, low income farmers, retraining farmers. Um, there's a huge interest, not just in, in eating, which you know most of us share an interest in that, but there's a huge interest in, in growing and taking the, the natural interest and skills of people who come into this country who no longer find a way to use those innate skills uh, and put them to work growing food for themselves and for their communities. So you find these Asian communities, the Salvadoran communities, the a lot of the African communities are all interested in growing food for their communities, um, their ethnic food. So there's a lot of, a lot of interest in that and, and we've been working on that. Brookline is really a, a a really interesting laboratory for what can be done here. Um, it's really nice for us to be, you know, a privately held working operation in Brookline. But maybe we sort of feel like we can be maybe a bit of a role model insofar as we can we can do a pretty good job growing for fresh food and and moving it out to people like you. Um, but what can you what can you do here? And, and Glenn sort of hit on it a little bit. He's, you know, working on quarter acre lots. But when I look at a town like Brookline, I see several square foot lots. I see 
linear corridors, dividers. I see uh, borders along public parks. I see uh, window box gardens, pot gardens, portable gardens, vertical gardens, rooftop gardens. Veg vegetables are vegetative. They make fabulous ornamentals if you let them go to seed. You can, you can harvest lettuce over and over again. Eventually, it's going to go to seed. You get a fabulous plant. Cardoons, artichokes, celery, rhubarb. Um, the amount of produce you can grow in your backyard in a pot uh, along, uh, along a fence row. It can be public property. It can be private property. It's staggering. But, you know, not everybody likes to do the work. You've got, you know, one-tenth of an acre backyard, you can grow something in it, but you know, that's not your cup of tea. I'm not looking at anybody, but you know, maybe it's not your cup of tea. The kid next door, the guy down the road, you know, there's always somebody who wants to do this kind of work, and it's a, it's a trade-off. You provide the land, maybe you buy the seed, they do the work, maybe you get a couple of heads of lettuce out of the deal. There's, there's an endless opportunity to do things. Gardening and farming is it's not only, it's not just an art, it's an art form. And it's, it's extremely creative, it's extremely meditative. You, you hit on, and, and not very hard, on some of the, the healing properties of playing in the dirt. Kristen Kimball's book, I think, she kind of touched on it. It was, it, was, it was very personal, but, you know, I mean, she, bailed out of a pretty humdrum life in New York and, and found a pretty um, exciting way of life. Um, I'm not sure that watching my team of horses split the guardrail at full gallop is, you know, could get my blood pressure up. But, you know, you don't have to do it at that scale. You don't need 500 acres of Champlain Valley soils to do this, you can do it on 500 square feet or 500 square inches. So it's all about figuring out how to do uh, what you want to do. And it's all about all of us getting together in a town like Brookline where there, there are limited amount of public spaces, but some fairly good sized lots. What can we do as a community to begin to do something for each other and for ourselves to provide sustenance for ourselves, reside, provide sustenance to our neighbors. Maybe you've got um, an elderly, an infirm neighbor who could do with a little fresh food once in a while, a nice head of lettuce or a couple of tomatoes. And nurturing ourselves and each other in these very small ways, and, and it's sort of atomic. Every, you know, you get all these little atoms together, and all of a sudden you've got something that really works. And it's, it's about creating community around food. Um, Looking, looking ahead as, as these towns develop and the cities develop, what can we institute in the way of, of uh, building codes, zoning codes? How can we get the next hospital that opens up to not only paint their walls something other than that foul green color that they use, so, or parking lots. I mean, oh, I'm on the red floor, not on the blue floor. Why can't we do um, something more artful? But then on the roofs, on the walls, it's, it's public space, it's in this public sphere. Why can't we do something with that to, to create an agricultural or horticultural opportunity? And I, and I think there's an opportunity, I think there's an understanding, I think there's now an interest in more creative use of what otherwise not useful or not perceived to be useful spaces. So without beating a dead horse too much harder, I can't wait to see that mobile processor come down the streets of Dorchester on a 16-foot <laughs> flatbed truck and a 25-foot trailer. And how many thousands of chickens on a floor? <laughs> I, I want to be there. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe.
Uh, obviously, by its name, it's Brookline Oil. So I want to give you a chance to tell us uh, what you're doing. So John just told the story of Brookline. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs>
So what you should do before you leave is make sure you can take, take a look at the boards, which gives some little snapshots of some of the work that we have done. Take, pick up a card, check out our website, and sign up because it's really about everyone in the community participating in this discussion and in this action that, that will grow. Thank you, Kevin. Someone who represents the town and what the town actually sees over and provides, and that is community gardens. Barbara Wesley works for the Department of Public Health. Uh, Barbara had uh, got introduced introduced to gardening from her grandmother in New Jersey, and she moved to a farm in Wisconsin. So she's got some personal uh, ties to the earth and gardening. So can you tell us about the town, what the town sees? Okay, so my public health background was supposed to be a secret. Okay, <laughs> I'm here. I'm here as a gardener, and and and, and I, I, from the age of five to eighteen, I lived on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. So two two things I'm going to tell you about, and I'm just going to keep it fast because I was told five minutes. So the Lars Anderson Park uh, in the 1940s, between 1940 and 1945, uh, Lars Isabella, what was her name? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, the Lars Anderson family, uh, the wife particularly, oh, well, Isabella. Well. I, that was her, yeah. Uh, she gave the town uh, uh, some land out of Lars Anderson uh, to use as victory gardens. This was World War II era. Okay, that's the history. That land has been there ever since. Um, then we have 103 gardens. Some of them are 15 feet by 15 feet and some of them are 15 feet by 30. Oh, I've had to make more and more smaller plots because we have a huge demand, and I just want to correct Kathy. Anybody can have a garden, you just have to wait a little while. Okay? <laughs> you just have to wait a little while. So, so you can so come to us and find the, the it. Waiting, the waiting list is about one and a half years right now, but you, if you stay on the waiting list, and I find that people who do stay on the waiting list, they're really motivated. And they really want a garden if they if they can you know once they've they've had one and a half years to plan it so they're usually some of my best gardeners. Um, we get great support from the town of Brookline uh, through the parks department uh, and the recreation department. Our soil uh, has been tested many times. We people test it individually in their individual plots, but we haven't had any issues. Um, Leadership is I. It's sort of a dictatorship right now. I'm I'm the <laughs> volunteer coordinator. This is my volunteer job, um, but I have a lot of organizational uh, experience. But I have a lot of support from my gardeners. I'm I'm holding our winter meeting this year, and I think they can see that my hair is getting grayer. And so somebody's taken over the raffle. Somebody's taken over the entertainment. Um, every single member of the gardening community that comes to our functions, and we try to have a couple a year, gets, gets a voice. So we go around, we share our information. It's almost like an informal education uh, session right then and there, because uh, everybody says what, what uh, grew well, what didn't grow well, what did they do about the blight, you know, what they bought from Allendale. <laughs> you know, but we, sh we share a lot of information. Um, we have nine compost bins right now. Uh, we tend to, a lot of people keep giving us their compost bins, the black ones. So now we have nine in a row and we are making absolutely exquisite compost. And, and if you go out, if any of you are dog walkers, you take a walk in Lars Anderson Park, come and see our compost operation. I'm very proud of it. Uh, we do have rules. I used to call them guidelines. I switch it to rules. Uh, the, basic, the basic thing is use it or lose it, and, and, and no invasive crops, and, and respect your neighbor. Um, uh, we, we use Allendale's educational programs on seeds, you know, how to grow your seedlings. We use BNAN for how to be a gardener program that is run by Boston Natural Areas Network. Um, we use the NOFA. Um, educational sessions that are now being held at Brookline High School. So we don't hold our own educational sessions, but I do refer my gardeners to any of those kinds of things. 
I've had people get engaged out at the gardens. <laughs> I, ha I haven't seen a wedding out there yet. Uh, we have babies, we have little sandboxes, uh, we have toys, we have, you know, so it's, 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 a, it's, it's a recreational program. Um, last year, by total surprise, um, the BU freshmen uh, got in touch with me and a group of the uh, incoming freshmen came out there. BU took care of all their transportation, even provided them with the garden gloves, and they helped me clean up some of the plots that, uh, that were not gonna be renewed for the next session. And also the recreation department helped me turn over the compost. So did the BU students. Um, that's the, I wanted to tell you about the community gardens out at Lars Anderson. There's another initiative I'm involved in, and that's a garden that we started last year on cement. So I just wanna let you know that you can have just cement, okay? Just a little bit of cement <laughs> and a raised bed. You can uh, uh, build it yourself or you can buy the, the lumber and the supplies. Uh, it's at the Brookline Health Department. It was in an empty space that uh, had a couple of weeds in it and nothing else except a, a drainage system. Now that, that, that proved to be very useful. So in this garden uh, right now, and you can walk by it, we uh, invite people to pick from it. Uh, we uh, have one big raised bed of, of cedar that we, untreated cedar that was built. Uh, and then we recycled recycling bins. Remember how we all had to switch to the big blue bed bins from the blue small ones? Almost every, uh, all of our little raised beds now are those blue recycling bins. You can't we can't get them anymore. I tried. You can get them, I can tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want some. <laughs> you want some? Okay, they, they, they're still stashed away. They haven't been taken away yet. Uh, we had a huge harvest. We couldn't believe it. We had arugula, lettuce, radishes, tomatoes. Uh, in, the, in the earth that was there, we did not plant, we didn't have it tested yet, but we planted sunflowers, beautiful sunflowers. So many photographers came and took pictures of those sunflowers. And we, and we did a, a crop rotation, we still have herbs. Unfortunately, that last freeze took our wonderful iceberg lettuce, so we didn't pick it in time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being patient. Um, a wonderful panel, uh, great information, and, and a wide breadth of activity. I think you can see that things are happening. Uh, so I hope that you're inspired. I hope that you have a little bit more information. I hope you're starting to make plans on maybe doing something that you've never done before. Um, I know I, I have a, a background that was close to the earth when I was growing up, and since I moved to Brookline, busy with your, your career and your family, but it's time that we all take little steps. So uh, hopefully uh, you've got the inspiration and the information out. Thank you for coming. If you want, if I, I know we didn't have a chance to get questions from the audience, but I, I want to at least give ch people a chance to, to leave now. If you want to stay and ask questions, feel free to, but thank you for coming. And we have, if, if you need a, a, a refreshment before you leave, we have some cider in the back. <laughs>